So what is the refitting syndrome? So first of all, it happens after patient has had prolonged starvation. And we don't talk about those dogs and cats that have not eaten for a couple of days. Typically, refitting syndrome happens in animals that were starved for weeks. We're talking about two, three, four weeks. The majority of the patients will have evidence of severe malnourishment. So they're gonna be emaciated, and it will be very clear on your exam that this patient has been starving for a long time. As a result of starvation, this patient typically develop severe intracellular depletion of electrolytes because they were not getting it with food for a very, very long time. So it's a whole body depletion of electrolytes, not just potassium, but also phosphorus and magnesium. So there's one very interesting case report in JVAC that was published relatively recently in the last two or three years where they describe a dog that was trapped in the well. So it fell down into the well and the owner couldn't find it for a long time. And 27 days later, the dog was found. It was still alive, but it looked like this. Uh, it was extremely emaciated. It had no muscle mass and was extremely, extremely sick. But surprisingly, this dog was still able to eat. And unfortunately, the first veterinarian that saw the dog offered this dog a lot of food. So the dog was just wolfing down all of this food and not surprisingly, the dog developed extremely severe refeeding syndrome that almost resulted in, in the death. However, the dog was referred to a specialty hospital and after a prolonged intensive care, the dog made it back home. So what is the pathophysiology behind a refeeding syndrome? So first of all, in order to develop refeeding syndrome, the patient should be starving for a long time, and then you feed this patient very quickly with large volume of food. That leads to a relative increase in insulin release and decreased glucagon production. That will result in massive translocation of glucose, phosphate, potassium, magnesium into the cells in the face of whole body electrolyte depletion. And as a result, this patient may develop extremely severe electrolyte derangements, such as severe hypophosphatemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypokalemia. Severe hypophosphatemia may lead to hemolytic anemia because without phosphorus, phospholipid layer of red cells will become weak and these red cells tend to hemolyze faster. Also, hypophosphatemia may cause cardiac failure if it's very severe and hypomagnesemia as well as hypophosphatemia may cause neurological dysfunctions. And finally, low potassium may lead to muscle weakness and respiratory failure. All of that unfortunately may lead to death. So this condition is life-threatening and you don't want to ignore that. What are the general guidelines that will help you to prevent refitting syndrome from developing? So first of all, you want to identify the patients at risk. So if you think about dog I just showed you in the case report, that definitely gonna be a super high risk for refitting syndrome. Next, you want to correct fluid and already existing electrolyte imbalances before you start feeding. It may take you six to 12 hours, maybe longer, but it's important to fix all of that before you start feeding. Next, you want to administer nutrition very, very gradually and increase it incrementally. So typically we start with third RER, but in this particular cases with super high risk of refeeding, you may start 10 to 20% RER calculation when you just start feeding. Next, you want to frequently monitor electrolytes every four to eight hours if necessary, especially during the first couple of days. Then you want to supplement electrolytes and thiamine as needed if you see any derangements. And you want to discontinue or slow down nutrition should any complications arise or you see severe electrolyte derangements. So thiamine is a vitamin B1 that was also implicated in refeeding syndrome. And we know that by giving thiamine, you may decrease the risk of refitting syndrome as well.